This module will explore some aspects related to different forms of violence inflicted on children, with special emphasis on the determinants and the consequences of such exposure on child development and well-being. In this class, we will explore the question, why should this be a topic of interest to economists? Then we will look into some indicators that will show us aspects of the reality of violence towards children across countries. We will then introduce some definitions and discuss issues related to measuring violence. Then we will discuss a theoretical framework to study its causes and consequences. We will end by reviewing relevant empirical studies analyzing determinants of child maltreatment, the effects of child abuse and neglect on children's outcomes, and the effect of harsh parenting on early child development. We would like to start by discussing why studying violence towards children in its multiple forms is a relevant topic for economists. First, understanding its causes and consequences can contribute to our understanding of the links between socioeconomic circumstances faced by children in their early ages and their performance later in life. At this stage, there is plenty of evidence linking the socioeconomic conditions and family structure during early childhood to their performance in school, standardized test scores, labor market outcomes, as well as many other outcomes. For recent and comprehensive review, see the study by Almond et al., 2018. The mechanisms through which these effects operate are not always well understood, and child maltreatment is only one possible way in which socioeconomic factors may affect children's outcomes. For instance, parents under stressful economic conditions like poverty may be more prone to harsher parental strategies. In turn, maltreatment in children has been linked to poorer academic performance and health, greater delinquency in substance use, unintended pregnancy, and other behavioral problems that may result in poor labor market outcomes later in life, including abuse to their own children. For these reasons, this class presents a review of the causes and consequences of violence towards children, with a focus on the violence experience at home. We will review the main findings in economic literature, as well as presenting an overview of the current state of children worldwide regarding their exposure to some forms of violence. For reasons that we will explore in this class, it is difficult to generate precise estimates of the prevalence of violence. However, available studies indicate that most children in the world are exposed to violence, either physical, psychological, sexual, and in many cases to multiple forms simultaneously. And a relevant fact is that a large part of non-lethal violence originates in their own family environment. For instance, close to three in four children aged two to four years of age worldwide, which is around 300 million children, experience violent discipline by their caregivers on a regular basis, and around six in ten are punished by physical means. UNICEF tells us that based on data from 30 countries, six in ten children aged 12 to 23 months are subjected to violent disciplinary methods and that almost half experience physical punishment and a similar proportion are exposed to verbal abuse. In addition, worldwide, about a quarter of all children under age five live with a mother who herself is a victim of intimate partner violence, exposing them to an already violent domestic environment. Violence in the family environment occurs in a context where parental use of violence is legal in more than 70% of countries worldwide which does not help in making the necessary changes in social norms to reduce its prevalence. Violence can take many forms and degrees of severity. The more severe forms of violence, including physical violence that ends in death and sexual violence, are highly prevalent in many countries. Now let's review some statistics to give us a general overview of how widespread violence towards children is worldwide. Using UNICEF data from a comparable group of countries, this graph presents the percentage of children aged 2 to 14 years of age who experience physical punishment and or psychological aggression in each country. 
Two conclusions stand out from this graph. First, the prevalence of violence is high in all countries in the study, with a prevalence in most of them of well above 50% of children affected and the second is that the most common situation is that children are exposed to both physical and psychological violence in their households. Using the same data, in this table we have the percentage of children aged 2 to 14 years who experienced any violent discipline by the age groups 2 to 4 years old, 5 to 9 years old, and 10 to 14 years old. The most relevant information in this table is that prevalence is high in most countries for all three age groups, including two to four year old children, indicating that in most countries children are exposed to violence since very early in their life. In the 10 to 14 year group, although prevalence of violence decreases in some countries, it still remains high in most of them, even when children are older. In this graph, we observe the percentage of children aged 2 to 14 years who experienced any discipline in the past month by type and by age of the child. The most prevalent form of discipline is explaining to the child what they did wrong. However, it is closely followed by shouting, yelling, or screaming. At the same time, other forms of violence are fairly common, such as hitting, insulting, or shaking of the child. In the World Safe study, which presents comparable rates of physical and psychological punishment, we see a more detailed picture of different forms of aggression used within households in five countries. First, we observe that the most common form of severe physical punishment is hitting the child with an object, followed by kicking and beating the child. For severe physical punishment, we see a correlation with income levels as countries with higher per capita income such as the U.S. and Chile, have significantly lower levels of severe physical punishment. For moderate forms of physical punishment, which include spanking, slapping, and shaking the child, amongst others, two things appear clearly. One, the incidence of this level of aggression is much higher than severe punishment, and two, there is less variation across countries. In the last panel, we observe that verbal or psychological punishment, in particular yelling or screaming, is present in the vast majority of households, along with other forms of psychological abuse, such as calling the child names, cursing, threatening abandonment, etc. One important feature of violence towards children, when we consider all forms of violent discipline, is that it does not seem to be strongly associated with income or wealth. In this graph, we observe that for most of the countries with data, children from wealthier households are just as likely to experience violent discipline as those from poorer households. And this comes from the fact that the use of violent disciplinary methods is widespread in most countries worldwide and also across different socioeconomic backgrounds. In most countries worldwide, violence towards children, in particular non-lethal violence, is legal or not fully prohibited. The following map shows countries' legal status regarding corporal punishment of children. More than 70% of countries allow some form of physical punishment in some contexts, like in households or schools. Although some progress has been made in the last decades, there are still challenges in most countries, including those related to enforcement of the law when prohibitions have been enacted. As indicated previously, there are different types of violence that children can be exposed to. This map shows the number of homicide victims among children aged 0 to 9 years per 1,000 inhabitants. The data indicates that the rates are particularly high in some countries in Central America and Africa. Another relevant and highly prevalent form of violence is sexual abuse. Although not exclusive to girls, it's certainly more common with them. Here we observe the percentage of girls aged 15 to 19 years old who, in the last 12 months, experienced forced sexual intercourse or other forced sexual acts. Regrettably, we see that in several developing countries, rates are well over 10%, with some countries reaching 20% of children experiencing a sexual assault and we could expect that these numbers underreport the actual prevalence of sexual abuse. In terms of bullying, the data again shows a high incidence in many countries, 
including several high-income countries, although several regions in Africa report the highest prevalence. In this section, we will explore some formal definitions and measures of violence towards children. Before we introduce a definition of violence, it is important to mention that it is not easy to measure, and there are several dimensions that need to be considered that can be relevant in the analysis. First, there are different types of violence, including physical, sexual, and emotional, amongst others. Second, violence can occur in different settings. For instance, it can take place at home, in schools, at workplaces, in the streets, and even over the internet. Third, the perpetrator can vary. It can be the parents or any caregiver. It could be a family member, a peer, an intimate partner, an authority figure, or a stranger. Fourth, violence varies in its frequency. It can be systematic or it can be sporadic. Finally, there are levels of severity of violence, ranging from mild forms such as yelling or spanking a child to more severe forms such as hitting or even lethal levels. In terms of a formal definition, there is no single definition, although the United Nations had made efforts to have one. In particular, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, CRC, and the World Health Organization, WHO. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 19, indicates that violence includes all forms of physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect or negligent treatment, maltreatment or exploitation, including sexual abuse. In turn, the World Health Organization defines violence as the intentional use of physical force or power, threatened or actual, against oneself, another person, or against a group or community that either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. We will define four types of violence, physical, sexual, mental, and neglect or negligent treatment. Physical violence includes all corporal punishment and all other forms of torturous, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment as well as physical bullying and hazing by adults or by other children. In turn, corporal or physical punishment can be defined as any punishment in which physical force is used and intended to cause some degree of pain or discomfort. In most cases, corporal punishment often involves hitting children with the hand, like smacking or slapping or spanking, or with an implement, like a whip, stick, belt, shoe, wooden spoon, depending on the context or the perpetrator. It can also include, among other forms, kicking, shaking, or throwing children, scratching, pinching, biting, pulling hair, or boxing ears, caning, forcing children to stay in uncomfortable positions, burning, scalding, or forced ingestion. Sexual violence can be defined as any sexual activity imposed on a child by an adult, against which the child is entitled to protection by criminal law. Some examples include the inducement or coercion of a child to engage in any unlawful or psychologically harmful sexual activity, the use of children in commercial sexual exploitation, the use of children in audio or visual images of child sexual abuse, child prostitution, sexual slavery, sexual exploitation in travel and tourism, trafficking for purposes of sexual exploitation within and between countries, sale of children for sexual purposes, and forced marriage. Although in general sexual activities refer to actions by adults against children, they are also considered as abuse when committed by another child on a child, if the offender is significantly older than the victim or uses power, threatens, or any other means of pressure. At the same time, consensual sexual activities between children are not considered as sexual abuse if the children are older than the age limit defined by the state party. A highly prevalent form of violence is psychological or mental violence, which is often described as psychological maltreatment, mental, verbal, or emotional abuse, or neglect. Examples of verbal or psychological violence include all forms of persistent harmful interactions with a child. Scaring, terrorizing, and threatening, exploiting and corrupting, spurning and rejecting, isolating, ignoring, and favoritism. 
denying emotional responsiveness, neglecting mental and medical health, and educational needs. Some forms are insults, name-calling, humiliation, belittling, ridiculing, and hurting a child's feelings. Exposure to domestic violence. Placement in solitary confinement, isolation, or humiliating or degrading conditions of detention. Psychological bullying and hazing by adults or other children, including via information and communication technologies such as mobile phones and the Internet. Finally, neglect or negligent treatment can be defined as the failure to meet children's physical and psychological needs, to not protect them from danger, or to not obtain medical or birth registration or other services when those responsible for their care have the means, knowledge, and access to services to do so. Given this definition, there is a wide scope of potentially neglectful actions by adults, including physical neglect. This is the failure to protect a child from harm, including through lack of supervision, or to not provide a child with the basic necessities, including adequate food, shelter, clothing, and basic medical care. Psychological or emotional neglect includes lack of any emotional support or love, chronic inattention, caregivers being psychologically unavailable by overlooking young children's cues and signals, and exposure to intimate partner violence or drug or alcohol abuse. Neglect of a child's physical or mental health by withholding essential medical care. Educational neglect is the failure to comply with laws requiring caregivers to secure their children's education through attendance at school or otherwise. And finally, abandonment. Now, with these definitions of violence, how do we measure it? There are several aspects to discuss. The first is the way we collect the data, or its source. In practice, we have several forms of obtaining data, and they include the use of administrative data or collecting data through surveys. For administrative data, depending on the country or state, it is possible to access social and medical services, police records, justice system records, educational records, and other vital statistics. As any administrative record, it has its advantages and disadvantages. Among the advantages is the possibility of accessing high-quality data for large fractions of the population. But sometimes the disadvantage is that administrative records do not contain relevant or up-to-date information. Another possibility is collecting data through surveys. The advantages of surveys are the ability to access information not available in administrative records a potential to tailor specific questions in the survey, and the possibility of collecting information on both the perpetrator and the victim. But surveys can pose some challenges. They are often retrospective, so answers may suffer from different sources of bias, including recall bias, for instance, when older adults might have forgotten a violent event in the past. There is also selection bias. This relates to who answers the questions and how truthful they are. Another problem with surveys is that information must be disclosed in front of the interviewer, so victims or perpetrators might not answer truthfully. Although the use of self-managed devices, such as tablets, to answer a survey might diminish the scope of this problem, it does not eliminate it if the respondents are not confident in the anonymity of their answers. Quantitative data from administrative sources and surveys can be complemented with qualitative information to provide a broader and more comprehensive picture of the research question. The advantage of qualitative data is that it can provide valuable insights on the problem, although it has important costs. Typically, it is time-consuming and expensive, and it may suffer from research bias. In this section, we will explore a simple theoretical framework to understand the causes of violence towards children. Violence is a multifaceted phenomena resulting from the complex interplay of individuals, relationships, social, cultural, and environmental factors. One possible framework to understand violence towards children is through an ecological model to explore the relationship between individuals and contextual factors. To do this, we start at the individual level looking at characteristics of either the victim or the perpetrator 
that can be related to the prevalence of violence. The individual level can include biological or demographic factors, personality traits, behaviors, socioeconomic backgrounds, and others. Then there is the level of relationships, which is the immediate context in which violence takes place. It can be a parent-child relationship, amongst peers, or intimate partners. The type of relationship affects its frequency as the context affects the continuity and opportunity for its occurrence or reoccurrence. A third conceptual level is the community. It includes characteristics at the local level that can be associated and affect the prevalence of violence, such as income, poverty, and inequality at the local community, and unemployment, crime, or social mobility, amongst many others. The community level can include schools, neighborhoods, extended families, or social networks. Finally, we can include a societal level, which considers factors that make violence more or less accepted. This level contains societal norms and attitudes towards parental rights and roles, cultural acceptance of violence, the legal framework for dealing with delinquent behaviors, income and wealth inequality, and others. The ecological model can help us to think about how to frame and understand specific research questions related to violence towards children by either exploring its determinants or its consequences. Using the ecological model, we can explore the most common determinants of exposure to violence within families and households. Later, we will discuss why it is difficult to establish causal relationships. First, there is evidence that some children's characteristics are at least associated with violence. Studies have found that age correlates with violence. In several countries, physical abuse has a U-inverted shape, peaking at different ages. In terms of sex of the child, it has been found that girls are more likely to suffer sexual abuse and boys are more likely to suffer physical punishment. Also, studies show that lower child development levels and disabilities are correlated with violence. Here are some of the parental or caregiver characteristics we have. Sex. Male caregivers are more likely to abuse sexually, and women are more likely to use physical violence. Age. Younger parents are more likely to be physically abusive. Personality traits. Low self-esteem impulse control problems, mental health history, amongst others, have been found to be linked to the use of violence. Prior history of abuse and substance abuse. Finally, violence at home. There is evidence that the presence of intimate partner violence increases the risk of abuse or violence towards children. In terms of family characteristics, it has been observed that family structure is relevant single parents are more likely to be physically abusive. Also, socioeconomic conditions matter, as poverty, unemployment, and low educational levels may increase physical punishment. At the community level, it has been found that violence is associated with higher poverty rates, lower social capital in social networks, poorer access to health, fewer social and community services. In terms of societal factors, these are some of those. Poor economic conditions and trends, cultural norms including gender roles, child and family policies including less access to daycare, schools, parental leave, etc. Access to the criminal justice system. In this section, we will explore in more detail the consequences of violence towards children. There is a broad consensus on the negative effects of severe forms of violence and neglect towards children. This consensus comes from a large amount of literature in psychology, social work, and other related fields, providing evidence of its detrimental effects over a wide range of outcomes, including higher mortality and morbidity rates, in terms of physical health on cortisone regulation, brain development, brain and central nervous system injuries, fractures, ocular damage, hospitalizations, and others. It has been found to affect sexual dysfunction, STDs, or unwanted pregnancies. In terms of psychological and behavioral outcomes, 
alcohol and drug abuse, depression and anxiety, cognitive development, hyperactivity, school performance, eating and sleeping disorders, and suicidal behavior. In economic literature, there is a consensus that cognitive and non-cognitive skills that develop in early childhood have a significant impact on future adult outcomes. In a dynamic context, Heckman and co-authors have provided a theoretical framework to understand skill formation and its effect on productivity and the development of human capital. Two relevant characteristics of these models are that possible dynamic complementarities and self-productivity are present. Dynamic complementarities occur when previously acquired capabilities or skills may make current investments more productive. Self-productivity refers to the possibility that a given dimension of capacity or skill may also affect the accumulation of other distinct dimensions, for instance, the development of a cognitive capacity might provide health or vice versa. Since early childhood is a critical period in the formation of different types of skills, parents and educators and policymakers should be attentive to lack of investments and negative shock during early ages in life. In this context, parenting styles that incorporate violence or child maltreatment could affect the production of skills or investment shocks that hinder human capital formation. Violence towards children has not been an area where economists have researched extensively. The fact is that few studies analyze the consequences of severe forms of violence on children and adolescents. Relevant studies on this topic are Paxson and Waldfogel, Slade and Weisso, Curry and Whiteham, Curry and Tekin, and Petersoft. Although there is a strong consensus of the negative effects of severe forms of violence on children, the debate is not settled regarding the less harsher forms of parenting, such as physical or psychological punishment, which, as we saw previously, are much more prevalent. And in economics, these milder forms of violence have received even less attention, including the work by Paxson and Shady, Berthelon and co-authors, before looking to these studies in more detail, we will explore why economists have not researched this area extensively and why the debate on if milder forms of violence are really deleterious for children's development is not yet fully settled. The main reason is methodological. In particular, there are important challenges to infer a clear causal relationship between violence and children's outcomes. The main challenges to inferring a causal relationship between violence and children's outcomes are the following. First, exposure to violence is not fully exogenous. For instance, there are unobservables, both at the level of the child, parent, or household, that affect both the likelihood of violence as well as the outcomes under study. Second, to study violence, it is not possible to use experimental data because there are obvious ethical objections to the use of randomized control studies. Therefore, researchers need to use non-experimental methodologies, which can include fixed effects models, depending on the available data. It can include, for instance, family fixed effects or sibling fixed effects. Methodologies that use estimations with instrumental variables. In addition, Researchers must also confront other potential data problems that are common in this area. In general, it is difficult to have access to longitudinal data on exposure to violence. It is difficult to obtain a representative sample at the community or at the national level. Data collection typically uses self-reported data, either from parents or children, which can suffer from biases, in particular, reporting bias, which refers to whether girls or boys are more or less likely to report violence, and recall bias, which refers to who is more or less likely to remember exerting or receiving violence. For instance, it is possible that very young children and older people have poorer recollections. Finally, it is difficult to measure different aspects of violence, including its intensity or harshness and its frequency, and sometimes surveys change their methodologies which makes comparisons over time more difficult or impossible. 
In this section, we will review the main empirical studies in economics that analyze children's violence. First, we will review economic evidence on the causes of maltreatment with a look at two studies by Paxil and Waldfogel. The first, published in Papers and Proceedings of the American Economic Association in 1999, and the second in the Journal of Labor Economics in 2002. In these studies, the authors examine whether rates of child maltreatment are affected by the socioeconomic circumstances of parents in the U.S. They estimate a state-level panel model to analyze the impact that socioeconomic circumstances have on the incidence of child maltreatment. They measure child maltreatment with four outcomes, total number of cases at the state level, total number of victims, the number of physical abuse victims, and the number of neglected victims. The socioeconomic circumstances they were mainly interested in were parental work status and single parent households. The main results from their studies can be summarized by their work published in the Journal of Labor Economics. The table shows coefficients for their estimates of number of reports of child maltreatment and numbers of victims of maltreatment and the main variables of interest. As indicated in the table, they were interested in the role of parental economic circumstances and its effects on a fraction of children at the state level with working mums and absent dads. They found statistically significant effects over the total number of victims, victims of physical abuse, neglect, and other abuse. Similar results were found for the fraction of children with both non-working mums and dads. Their key findings indicate that socioeconomic circumstances do matter. Higher rates of maltreatment are associated with higher numbers of children with absent fathers and working mothers. Higher numbers of families with two non-working parents and also a higher share of families with incomes below 75% of the poverty line. In addition, they find that decreases in state welfare benefit levels are associated with increases in foster care placement. Although this type of study can be extremely useful in providing information regarding the potential factors affecting maltreatment, there are some caveats that need to be mentioned. First, conclusions of studies using aggregate data at a county, state, or country level cannot be directly generalized to individual level behaviors. This is the ecological fallacy problem. As their findings indicate, states with higher shares of families with no father and working mothers have higher rates of maltreatment. However, it is not possible to immediately conclude that working mothers with no partner or spouse are more likely to abuse their children. This is one possible explanation but other potential ones cannot be ruled out. Another potential problem of this type of study is data accuracy. How consistent is data collection across administrative units? How prone are people to denounce a case? Finally, and somewhat related to this point, is the data comparable across administrative units? Definitions of maltreatment, abuse, and neglect can vary across states or countries. The same event could be classified differently in two states or countries, or simply not counted in others. All these factors related to data point out the importance of having accurate and comparable data within and across countries. The next paper by Slade and Wiseau, published in the Economics of Education Review in 2007, presents evidence of the effects of violence on educational outcomes. In this work, they use a large data set of U.S. adolescent sibling pairs and explore the effects of maltreatment, neglect, physical aggression, and sexual abuse on adolescents' performance in middle and high school. They estimated a sibling fixed effect model with data from the 1994 to 2002 National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. They measured performance using four binary measures low GPAs, which is a C average or worse, not getting along with teachers and peers, not completing assignments, poor attendance. In terms of maltreatment, it is measured with an index that includes different events involving parents or other adult caregivers 
that occurred before the children were in sixth grade. The items included are neglect of basic needs, sexual contact, and physical aggression. Here we present Table 3 of their study, which shows their main results, that the maltreatment index has a negative and significant association with the probability of having a low GPA, which is consistent with studies from other disciplines, although no consistently significant association was found in the other outcomes, not getting along with teachers and peers, not completing assignments, and poor attendance. There are several reasons to explain the lack of association in other outcomes. Their measures of maltreatment were limited in content and were based entirely on retrospective self-reports, which can contain substantial measurement error and recall bias, to heterogeneity of effects of parenting on maltreated children, and a limited variability in the data given the use of a sibling fixed effects model. Here we discuss evidence of the relationship between childhood maltreatment and crime. In a study published in the Journal of Human Resources in 2012, Curry and Tekken analyzed the relationship between child maltreatment and crime, also using data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, Ad Health. They implement several econometric methods to estimate the relationship including ordinary least squares, OLS, with a rich set of controls, as well as sibling and twin fixed effects models. They have several measures of crimes committed in the past 12 months by adolescents, including property damage, assault, armed robbery, burglary, theft, any hard drug use, any non-drug crime, whether the youth was ever convicted, and whether the respondent was himself or herself a victim of crime. Their main results can be summarized in the following table, which reports regression estimates for the twin and siblings fixed effects models. The table presents the estimated coefficients for the independent variable that measures any type of maltreatment. The estimates suggest that maltreatment not only increases the probability that an individual will engage in several types of criminal behaviors, burglary, property damage, assault, amongst others, but also increases the probability that he or she will be a crime victim. The gender-specific estimates suggest that both maltreated boys and maltreated girls are more likely to commit crime although the estimates are much less precisely estimated. Another work that looks at the relationship between childhood maltreatment and educational outcomes is the work by Petersa, published in Health Economics in 2015. In this study, the author explores the relationship between adverse childhood experiences and educational outcomes in Cape Town, South Africa. He measures two educational outcomes, results in a numeracy test, and dropout levels. His measures of childhood maltreatment are based on questions administered to all respondents of the survey. They include questions regarding being hit hard, pushed, afraid of being hurt, and being put down by adults. In addition, he creates an aggregate measure to reflect the overall severity of maltreatment. The methodologies used in the study include models estimating neighborhood and sibling fixed effects. The data comes from the Cape Area Panel Study, and it includes young people aged 14 to 22 years in 2002. The main results are summarized in the following tables. The tables summarize estimations on several models and show estimates for different forms of maltreatment being hit hard, being pushed, being afraid of being hurt, and being put down by adults. In the top table, the outcomes are from numeracy test scores. In the bottom table, the outcomes are probabilities of dropouts. Estimations indicate maltreatment is associated with adverse consequences in terms of numeracy test scores and probabilities of dropouts. Estimates indicate a stronger association for dropouts than for numeracy skills. Results are statistically significant for both outcomes using the aggregate measure of maltreatment. In our last paper, 
we review a study that looks into the relationship between harsh parenting and early childhood development. This work is by Bertholon, Contreras, Kruger, and Palma, and it was published in Economics and Human Biology in 2020. The paper studies the effects of mild forms of parental violence, also known as harsh parenting, on early childhood cognitive and socio-emotional development in Chile, and it is the first study on early childhood development. The authors used two measures of child development, one for cognitive development, the Peabody Pitcher Vocabulary Test, and another one for socio-emotional development, as measured by the Child Behavioral Checklist. In terms of the measures of harsh parenting, they use one from a parental self-report and one observed by a psychologist. Violence is categorized as verbal or psychological if the parent scolds, shouts, or threatens a child, and or physical if the parent regularly hits their child. The model that they estimate, taking advantage of the panel structure of the data, is a value-added model. In this model, the dependent variable y is a measure of child development in period t. As indicated previously, child development is measured either by the Peabody Pitcher Vocabulary Test or the Child Behavioral Checklist. The independent variables are the following. First, they include a vector of child development variables in the previous period. This vector is reflected in y t minus 1. Then for the variable of interest, or harsh parenting, represented by the hp variable, they include different measures of harsh parenting. In addition, they include vectors of control variables with information for the child in vector C, the pregnancy in vector P, the mother in vector M, and the health. They include vectors of control variables with information for the child in vector C, the pregnancy in vector P, the mother in vector M, and the household in vector H. Their data comes from the National Early Childhood Longitudinal Survey, ELPI. Results of their study is summarized in Table 4. The table shows coefficient estimates for both measures of harsh parenting, self-reported and observed. Both measures are an indicator of whether the mother uses verbal and or physical violence against the child. The first set of columns includes the cognitive outcomes, and the second, the socio-emotional development outcomes of the child. All estimates show a significant association with harsh parenting. Overall, their findings indicate that exposure to harsh parenting is associated with lower language development and more behavioral problems. In addition, harsh parenting significantly increases the probability that children fall into the category deemed as risky or in clinical ranges in their behavior. Their estimates suggest that there is no difference in the effects of verbal and physical aggressions, but what matters is exposure to either of them, and also that persistence of harsh parenting is relevant. They also conduct some heterogeneity analysis and find that the association between harsh parenting and child development holds for both boys and girls, and that children from lower-income households have stronger negative associations for language development. Overall, their results are consistent with Paxson and Shady, published in the Journal of Human Resources in 2007, who found that parental harshness is negatively correlated with cognitive development in Ecuador. And now for our conclusions. In this module, we have explored several aspects related to the causes and consequences of violence against children. This lecture can be seen as a first approach to this topic, and given its wide scope, multiple facets of the phenomena have been overlooked or simply not explored given the time constraints. We have explored some of the many forms that violence can take, including physical or psychological violence, sexual abuse or neglect, and we have seen how pervasive it is in most societies in the world. We reviewed the literature and found that there is a broad consensus on the deleterious effects of the most severe forms of child abuse and neglect on children's health, development, 
and long-term economic prospects, amongst others. Although there is less consensus regarding lesser forms of violence towards children, including the effect of different forms of parenting styles. In terms of the research agenda in this area, there are several research challenges. Studies should provide stronger causal evidence both regarding the causes and the consequences of violence towards children. We need a better understanding, both theoretical and empirical, of the role of violence in the process of skill formation and we would like to improve our understanding of programs slash interventions that can help to reduce violence at individual or community levels or to change parenting styles. Policy implications. Given the negative association with relevant developmental and life outcomes, government and policymakers should incorporate in their agendas policies geared towards improving parental skills and preventing violence in different contexts such as the home or schools.